Last study we were in the place called Gethsemane and tonight we're in the most interesting place called Gabbatha. And we're going to look at that from John's Gospel, chapter number 18 and chapter number 19 tonight. Now I don't propose to read every verse tonight. I'll let you do your homework at home, but I'm going to read a few selective verses from John chapter 18 and John chapter 19. Now we're in verse 28 of John 18 and it says here, Then led they Jesus from, uh, from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring you against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. The, jo the Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Now, just for connection, a verse in chapter number 19, just to finish up the passage, verse number 12, And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth, and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was a preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, they said unto the Jews, Behold, your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Now we come to the point in our studies where we leave behind uh, Gethsemane and actually there is a missing part in our studies that's in the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, and then we come to Gabbatha. I suppose the man in the street, he might know a little bit about Gethsemane and he might know a little bit about Golgotha, but he's probably never heard about Gabbatha. But with the help of the Lord tonight, I want to look at this most interesting study about Gabbatha. I want to just make an apology right at the start. If you hear the name Pontius Pilate used a lot this evening, that's because he's really in the centre of this paragraph, or this passage. I will exalt the Lord, of course, but you'll see the depth that man stoops to, and it's personified in a man called Pontius Pilate. For those in Grenada, just a little interesting little part of history, that they say that Pontius Pilate was born in the very place that I live, just very nearby, just a few miles from where I live, in Scotland. And so whether he is the only Scotsman in the Bible or not, we do not know. But well, this is a man we'll see a lot about tonight. But there, that horrific man stands before the, the most wonderful person who ever lived, the Lord Jesus. And we'll see a lot of Christ tonight. Now I want to just think for a moment or two a little bit about what this place is. It's called Gabbatha. We don't actually see that until the end of the John's uh, Gospel in chapter 19. We have to read quite a bit into the Gospels before we find it. And we don't see it in any of the Synoptic Gospels. No mention of the place called Gabbatha. Only John records it. I've been in Israel a few times and one of the places I've been at is, as far as we can tell, it's Gabbatha. It's called the Lithostratus in uh, Hebrew. And uh, you go down into the basement of a convent. It's very near the Pool of Bethesda and you go into that convent and into the basement and they are very, very deep down because Jerusalem has been built upon years and years of rubble. Right at the bottom is a pavement with shiny paving stones, absolutely incredible, from 2,000 years ago. And carved onto those pavement you can see the marks of chariot wheels and you can also see the marks of the Game of Kings, I believe it's called, and the Soldier's Game where they marked the different squares out, almost like a game of drafts or chess, and you see that marked on that pavement. Well, that is the historical background, and perhaps that's the very place that the Lord Jesus went to. It is a, called a pavement. As far as I understand, there are no other pavements mentioned in scriptures. I suppose you think about John's Gospel when the Lord bowed and he wrote on the ground, but it doesn't say the word pavement. And this is the only time, as far as I remember, that the word pavement is used in our scriptures. And so here we are, we're coming to this interesting little pavement in the land of Israel where we see these things happen. 
Now just one more comment of introduction, what had happened immediately before it? The cock had crowed three times, and Peter had denied, had two times, and Peter had denied the Lord three times. I, I believe that that refers to three o'clock in the morning, the cock crowing was classed as a Roman time of three in the morning. And now we come, and we're going to start now thinking, not now of Peter denying the Lord, but the Lord standing before Pilate. Now let's get to verse 28 of chapter number 18. And we want to first of all notice the time. Mark's gospel in chapter 15 says, straightway in the morning. And we know it was well before six o'clock in the morning because John chapter 19 and verse 14 actually mentions the sixth hour. In Roman time, that's six o'clock in the morning. So the clock was ticking. It really was ticking very fast because we know the Lord had to be on that cross from, from the, uh, at nine o'clock in the morning and we see that the clock was ticking. It seems that evil has a rush to do its job. For 33 years, the Lord had walked his earth and now in just a matter of hours, they're going to pull forth or did I say even minutes, they're going to pull forth judgment upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord stands before, first of all, the religious sphere. We notice that in verse number 28, it's Caiaphas, and he was a high priest. It's a very interesting study in itself, it's not my topic for tonight, but you notice that the Lord stood before Annas, and then he stood before Caiaphas. And these were Sadducees, and they made the decision that they hated the Saviour, and so the Lord Jesus now is standing before Caiaphas. And then he hands the Lord over, Caiaphas hands the Lord over to Pilate. Now, it's a direct movement from the religious sphere into the political sphere. And now time is moving forward very fast and the political sphere has to take prominence. Now, why does the political sphere have to take prominence? Well, we read it in our passage tonight. It's because the Jews, they had no ability to, uh, they had no ability to carry out the death sentence, but they wanted the Lord Jesus Christ crucified. You and I know that the scriptures would tell what manner of death the Lord Jesus Christ had had, would have. And yet when the Jews had responsibility, they were happy that a woman would have been stoned to death. And they were happy that Stephen was stoned to death. But as far as the Lord Jesus was concerned, it had to be crucifixion that the scriptures might be fulfilled. They pierced my hands and my feet. And so the Lord Jesus Christ had to be crucified and it was going to be now that the judgment was going to be drawn at six o'clock or so in the morning. But not now the time is in mind, but we think about the trial. Because if there was ever a trial that was rough justice, this was it. It was the most appalling trial. It's almost ironic that the Lord Jesus, he stands in the hall of judgment. The scriptures say about him, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And now he's in the hall of judgment and he's in Pilate's hall of judgment. Probably the most appalling judge that there's ever been on this earth. And he stands in judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ. What an awful day it was when the Lord was in this judgment hall. But we noticed something interesting about this, because Pilate had it in mind that he would come out to the people, because the people wouldn't come into him, because they were concerned about defilement. The Jews wanted to eat of the Passover, and they didn't want anything that would class themselves as defiled. Isn't it, sort of, again, very ironic that they were happy with murder, but they didn't want to be defiled, lest they were unclean to eat the Passover? And man reconciles this kind of thing in their mind all the time. They're strange moral judgments. And here they wanted to kill the Lord Jesus, the Prince of Life. And uh, they didn't want to be defiled. And so Pilate had to come in and out. Now, if I read my scriptures correctly, I think Pilate must have gone in and out at least four times out and four times in. Let's just notice a few of these. Verse number 29 of chapter 18, then verse 33 and then in verse 38, and then in chapter number 19, verse 4, and then verse 9, and verse number 13. It seems to be that Pilate's going in and out, in and out, so that he might be able to please the Jews. Quite a strange circumstance that one who was so powerful was now being manipulated by the Jewish 
leaders. Now for the legal part, I don't have any legal training, so I'll just have to take what I've read and heard, but the legal argument was the most peculiar one. They brought the Lord to a Pilate, and there you can imagine that at least Roman justice had a measure of truth behind it. And they brought the Lord Jesus and said, well, what is your accusation that you bring against him? And they bring this most peculiar circular accusation. If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him unto thee. You could see the circular judgment. Why is he here? If he wasn't a malefactor, we wouldn't have brought him unto you. And they didn't actually bring forth a proper accusation against the Lord Jesus Christ. Pilate was no fool. He could see that they were trying to manipulate him. And he turns to them and says, judge him according to your law. Pilate got them now. If they were going to accuse the Lord Jesus, let it be done in their law. You know, the Romans, they didn't interfere in many ways with the Jewish customs and the Jewish law. They let them get on with it in the, in the most sense. But um, the Jews, they wouldn't have anything to do with it. You see, Pilate was a man who lacked any courage of his convictions. And it just seems that the Jews, they did manipulate him. And they made it quite clear. No, we have no right to be able to bring forth the death penalty. And you see the Lord standing in his judgment hall without a proper accusation and Pilate trying to see if there was an accusation and suddenly they turn it round to the death sentence upon the Lord Jesus Christ. History records about Pontius Pilate that normally he was inflexible, normally he was brutal, but now it seems to be that religious authority manipulates this political man. Well, let's just think a little bit more of the text because we know it is not now the time or not now the judgment or the trial. We want to think about the title because in verse 33, we see the title of King of the Jews. What a great title it was. Now, if you actually again trace the passage, you'll notice the use of the term king or kingdom very frequently. Verse 36 of chapter 18, verse 37, verse 39, going to chapter 19, verse uh, 3, and then verse 14 and verse 15, and verse number 19. And it seems written over all the passage is this term king, 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 kingdom. Now, I, I haven't counted the number of times it's used, but you would have to be deaf or blind not to be able to see and to hear that Christ was the king. And Pilate comes to the saviour and says, art thou the king of the Jews? It seems that the whole royal theme was troubling Pilate. You know, Pilate was a procurator. He was, a, a you would say, a government employee, a, a government ruler, but he wasn't a king. And Herod would be that king and he seems to be concerned about this whole subject of the king. I guess it gets comes to the end again when we come to later on in chapter 19 and we see there we have no king but Caesar. Again it comes forth that the Jews now are putting themselves in subjection to a Roman ruler called Caesar. A Roman ruler called Herod, a Roman ruler called Caesar, a Roman ruler called Pilate, and they're putting themselves in subjection when before them stands the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and they won't bow the knee to him because they hate the Lord Jesus Christ without a cause. Now, here is the one who has the greatest of genealogies, the greatest of birth, the greatest of prophecies, the greatest of words, the greatest of deeds. And Pilate stands before the Lord Jesus and what does the Lord Jesus initially say to Pilate? He says, absolutely nothing, nothing. Don't cast your perils before swine is what the scriptures say. And there, the Lord Jesus Christ, he said nothing to Pilate. Interesting again, when you think about Herod, he said nothing to Herod. And both Pilate and Herod marveled at the silence of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then the Lord speaks. And when the Lord speaks, he speaks words which are earth shattering. Is this your declaration? Verse 34, he says to Pilate, a question from the Lord. Come on, Pilate, you judge a lot of matters. Was this your declaration that I am the king of the Jews? And then the Lord, he makes a statement of fact. My kingdom is not of this world. You know, Pilate, your kingdom will come and go. 
but my kingdom is not of this world. I rule in a heavenly sphere. You rule in an earthly sphere. And then verse 37, to this end was I born, a proclamation from the king of kings. Again, he was saying that I was born a king. I will live as king. I will die as a king. I will be raised as a king. And every knee will bow to me as king and king, king of kings and lord of lords. And then fourthly, he says to Pilate, you could have had no power except it was given you from above. Pilate, you have no power. What a declaration from the Lord. He put Pilate exactly in his place, there at the place of judgment, there at Gabbatha. I don't know exactly the feelings of Pilate, but I would say he'd be quaking in his boots by now. as Because in verse 34, we notice the Lord challenges Pilate and he says, Is this your view? You cannot sit neutral with regards to the Lord Jesus. Pilate wanted to do that. Remember, he was the one who was made famous for washing his hands of Christ. You can't remain neutral with regards to the Lord Jesus. You've got to make a decision. My friend Jim McMaster, he often talked about that in gospel meetings. And he says there that at this meeting tonight, everyone makes a decision. Some choose to accept the Lord. Some choose to reject. There's a beautiful hymn in our gospel hymn book and it says this. Jesus is standing in Pilate's hall, friendless, forsaken, betrayed by all. Hearken what meaneth that sudden call. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do? What will you do? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? Then another verse says, will you evade him as Pilate tried? Or will you choose him whatever betide? Vainly you struggle from him to hide. What will you do with Jesus? Pilate was just perplexed at the Lord Jesus, with this royal title that the Lord had. And, and what was he going to do? Because here's Pilate and he's being asked to judge matters of Jewish law. And he says, am I a Jew? And in one sense, it does seem rather unfair that Pilate had this terrible duty to do. He was way out of his depth. He wasn't an expert in Jewish customs or Jewish law, but he was able to look at the evidence. And the evidence was stacked up right before him that this man had done nothing amiss. No accusation, no fault could be said against the Saviour. Even his own wife came to him and said, Have thou nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things in a dream because of him. And the evidence is stacking up quite clearly. There's no fault found in Christ. And yet Pilate is being manipulated about the Saviour. Let's keep moving because we want now to think about the truth. Interesting. Verse 38 comes. And in verse 37, we also notice this term truth. You can mark it and underline it in your Bible and you can see this word truth. The Lord talks, the one who is the way, the truth and the life. And Pilate stands before the Lord Jesus and he says one of his worst statements. He says a lot of things that are pretty horrific. And he says, what is truth? He's standing before the one who is the truth. And Pilate looks at the Saviour and says, what is truth? What a feeble response from Pilate. Isn't that the case with man often? Their feeble response with regards to the Saviour. You ask them, would you like to come to a meeting to hear about the Lord? And they say, I'm busy. Or they would say, I, or they would say, I have my own religion, which means they have nothing, their emptiness. And then other times they would say, oh, I'm very busy in my life at the moment. And they're making all kinds of excuses. And here's Pilate and says, what is truth? Things haven't really improved in 2,000 years. In fact, they've got worse. Because men have taken that which was truth and they've turned it into lies. And it seems in our society that everything other than the truth is held and, uh, and uh, believed by people nowadays. Now, don't misquote me. I'm not anti-democratic. But I, I notice that democracy is not based on the truth. It's not even based on the will of the majority, as people would make you believe. It's actually based upon the will of the vocal minority, who shout so loud that people start to believe the words of democracy. Let me warn you that our hope and our answer is not in democracy. Our hope and our answer is in theocracy, when the Lord rules and reigns on this earth. And here is the Lord standing before 
as it were, democracy, people wanting nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me again warn you that democracy, check your history books, brought Adolf Hitler. Democracy brought Vladimir Putin into rule in Russia. Democracy brought in Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. And Pilate goes out now and he uses democracy to try and get a decision about the Lord Jesus. He goes into the prison cells as his custom was and he brings out someone at the Passover and he brings out Barabbas. Now, he was in an insurrection, says the scriptures. He was a murderer and no doubt he was a horrendous man. The scriptures doesn't say too much about Barabbas, but he certainly wouldn't be your best friend. He brings him out probably because of how heinous he was and he stands him in comparison to the Saviour. And he asked democracy to make their view of Christ. Now let's think of what democratic should have done. They should have looked to the Saviour and said he's the one that feeds the 5,000. He, he's the one that walks on water. He's the one who brings peace and says peace. He's the one that raises people from the dead. He's the one who heals the sick. That's the one that we need. And yet the Democrats, they didn't want the Lord Jesus, they cried Barabbas. They made their vote for one man to get a small cross, the cross of their vote, that the other man would get a large cross on which he would be put on. And so, not this man, but Barabbas. Now we move to chapter 19 because we think of the treatment that they gave to the Saviour. Pilate had just heard these words, not this man, but Barabbas. And then the scourge is out, the whip is out, and he comes to scourge the Saviour. Now, I don't know whether it was Pilate that yielded that scourge. The scriptures would make it seem to be the case, or whether it was one of Pilate's men of war, but they came and they scourged the Saviour. And then the crown of thorns would be upon his head. And then they would smite him. And then they would strip him and put on him a purple robe and they dress him up as if he was a king and they had their moment when they mocked the saviour that's what they want to do with the lord jesus christ they mock the saviour and they bring forth the lord jesus to have a cheap laugh at christ and yet the scriptures in the psalms say yet have i set my king upon the holy hill of zion the lord shall laugh he shall have them in derision and the lord will get the laugh last laugh as it were on one day and yet on this day that we're considering at the Gabbatha at the pavement they're mocking the Saviour forever those stones are marked with mockery as the crowds shout at the Saviour and they say away with this man Pilate then says another phrase in verse number five he smugly brings the Saviour out and he says a phrase which makes me shake as I hear these words. And he brings forth the Saviour and he says, Behold the man. Echo homi in Latin. Behold the man. In uh, Trafalgar Square in London, there are four plinths around Nelson's column. Three of them occupied. One has never really been occupied. And the first uh, statue they put on that was a statue of the Lord. They made it life size, just the size of a, a normal man. And they put him on that. And they said, Echo homi, behold the man. And people were able to see something of the pathos of the scene of the Lord Jesus Christ being uh, taken to judgment in this scene. Pilate, he used it as a mockery, laughed at the man. Behold the man there at Echo homi, there at the Villa de la Rosa in Jerusalem and mocking the Saviour. Well, how horrendous that they did that to the Saviour. But Galatians 6 and 7 says this, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Pilate would ever go down in history as a man who had the Saviour before him and would mock the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's move on to think about my second last point. We want to think about the terror of the scene. It was a dark scene. Before six o'clock in the morning and the crowds were just crying out. You know, some people hate crowds. My late mother, she was one of these people. She preferred close friends to big crowds. 
and the crowd was crying for the blood of the Saviour. It's before six o'clock in the morning, crying for blood. And Pilate realised he had lost the crowd. That's the politician's worst nightmare. When they've lost the crowd, when there's no logic can ever turn their mind at all. And he says, I find no fault in him. And that's too late. Too late, Pilate, for your decision now about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because all they could hear was, crucify him, crucify him. This was not justice that the crowd wanted. The crowd wanted crucifixion. And no matter what was said by Pilate now, it was all too late. But it gets even worse for Pilate because there is a terror of the crowd. But then there's a terror in his own heart because in verse number 8 of chapter 19, it says there, he was more afraid. It seems to be that when he hears the statement or the title, Son of God, that soon Pilate realises that this is not just a good man. This is not even just the king of the Jews. This was the son of God that was standing before him. And Pilate then has terror in his heart. He was the more afraid. No wonder he made a symbolic gesture to wash his hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Pilate, you're in too deep now. You've got to make a decision. You've got to say what you're going to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot be neutral any more. Now, it seems to be that Pilate, and this is another subject in itself, seems to seek Herod and Herod to try and make a decision. It was futile because the Lord never said anything there to Herod and he never really said any more to Pilate. And then Pilate makes this kind of crazy speech. Look how powerful I am, he says there. Don't you realise I've got power to crucify you and power to release you? <laughs> and the Lord who reigns over all, the one who made this world in six days, by the word of his power, says, I... You have no power except it be given you from above. It was always a lie of Eden's garden when the serpent came and really tempted Adam and Eve to be like God. And to show them how much power they could possibly have. And yet it robbed power from Adam and Eve in Eden's garden. It robbed them of joy, it robbed them of peace, it robbed them of life. And here's Pilate, he thinks he's got all the power. But like every man, he would be dead within a few years. And so Pilate, his fall from grace would be swift and complete when he would be called back there to Rome and very soon Pilate himself would be dead. Now we've not even mentioned Gabbatha as such and we've come to the end of his study because in verse 13 to 16 we're going to call this our last point of a terminus. I don't know if you use that word in Grenada, but we use that word in Scotland. It's where the bus stops. The very final stop is the terminus. I believe it's actually a Latin term. Uh, well, I'm not much of a Latin scholar, but a Latin term, terminus, the end. And they come to this end, and it's Gabbatha. Pilate sets up a judgment seat on a raised platform. It's called the Bema. It reminds you of the judgment seat of Christ at a later day. Well, here it is, the Bema, the judgment and he makes his decision about the Lord Jesus. The flawed man on a judgment seat before the judge of all this earth, the son of God, Pilate, there was never ever a more inappropriate match of judge and a person in the dock as this particular occasion. Now, here he was. We wash his hands of Christ at Gabbatha. He heard his wife whispering in his ear in Gabbatha. The scourging that took place in Gabbatha. It stained with blood in that place, Gabbatha. And it is still before six o'clock in the morning. And in verse 15 we hear the conclusion. Crucify him. The deed was done. And the Lord Jesus Christ was to be taken and crucified. William Kirkpatrick, one of the Scottish hymn writers, says this, Forth from a Gabbatha see him led, Foes all around and friends all fled, Wearing the crown of thorns upon his head, Holy and righteous one. Pilate, the unrighteous judge, stands before the righteous judge of all the earth. Well, I hope you've enjoyed a little study tonight. We thought of the time, the trial, the title, the truth, the treatment, the terror and the terminus all experienced at this place called 
Gabatha. And if we have strength from the Lord, we're going to get to Golgotha in our next study. And in our final study, we can conclude at the garden. So enjoy God's word yourself. Read these things for yourself and may God bless you at this time. Thank you for listening.